In the 1990 Oscar-winning movie Awakenings, in which I'm sure most of you have watched, there's a scene where Dr. Sayre, played by Robin Williams, visits with an expert, Dr. Ingham, in an attempt to understand the condition of post-encephalitic Parkinson's that affects a number of his patients in the chronic hospital where he recently got hired. These patients were survivors of an outbreak of encephalitis lethargica that occurred between 1915 and 1926. As they watch the old film strips of the patients the expert has seen, he explains what happened to those who survived the acute stages of the infection. You remember the movie. They're basically human mannequins. Like Robert De Niro's character, they can be posed into different positions, uh, but they don't communicate at all, but yet they catch baseballs thrown at them, etc. But they're basically zombies, supposedly unaware of anything going on around them. Dr. Ingham says, Those who survived who awoke seemed fine, as though nothing had happened. We just didn't realize how much the infection had damaged the brain. Years went by, 5, 10, 15, before these strange neurological symptoms would appear, but they did. I began to see them in the early 1930s. The old people brought in by their children, the young people brought in by their parents. They could no longer dress themselves or feed themselves. They could no longer speak in most cases. Some families went mad. People who were normal were now elsewhere. Standing there watching the videos, Dr. Sayer asks, What's it like to be them? What are they thinking? Dr. Ingham says they're not. The virus didn't spare their higher faculties. Dr. Sayer says, we know that for a fact? Dr. Ingham quite confidently says, yes. Dr. Sayer says, because? To which his response encompasses the theme of the movie. He says, because the alternative is unthinkable. The alternative is that these people were aware of everything that was going on around them, but cannot move, cannot talk, they are trapped in their own body, and what's worse, no one knows it. As it turns out, the alternative was horrendously correct, but Dr. Sayer had to look at the facts and the evidence presented in the condition before he could discover the truth. In the Bible, John 8, 32 says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. One can hope, which is why I made this. One of the things that makes great stories great is the idea that the impossible or the improbable happened or that the impossible challenge was overcome or an impossible problem was solved. Awakenings based on true event and stories like it have a dramatic human element to them and discovering that people trapped in their own bodies that for a short time got to live again is a very good and emotional story, but only because of how it came about. If this story came out that these patients were all of a sudden given a food with a certain protein in it or something, or, or if they had a, a drug given to them to treat symptom A, and the side effect was to cure symptom B that they didn't even consider and it brought them back to life, there'd be no story. Hey, and we gave them this med, it brought them back to life for a short time, but it only worked for so long, and now they're back to being zombies. Boring. A story, especially a crime story, has to have an element of surprise and elements of, you know, wow, great idea, or who, who would have thought of that? Great problem-solving abilities. Uh, someone's great at hiding evidence or covering their tracks so that the problem solver looks really smart. Sherlock Holmes, for example. If this crime story of the murder of Teresa Holbach, as told by the prosecution, was made into a book or a movie, it would sell five copies. They think he did it. And then the car shows up on his property. Well, but they need a body for murder. Oh, burn bodies discovered on the property. They need to tie in that he moved the car. And oh, look at that. The key was found in plain sight after his room was searched seven times. Oh, they need to tie him to the gunshot for witness testimony. Oh, then a bullet's found in the garage after numerous searches. I mean, this would be the most boring story ever written. All of these necessary things just happen to fall into place at the right time. The ancient Greeks used to use this to fill the plot holes in their Greek tragedies like this usually with one of the gods coming down and bam, something miraculously happens. It even has its own term, Deus Ex Machina. All right, so if all these things happened in chronological order at the beginning of the Stephen Avery case, it would be open and shut in a day. Guilty, bam. Boring, but done. Move on with life. If the key pieces of evidence didn't just happen to pop up at the perfect times after a fine tooth comb was used, no one would have ever heard anything about this case. I state this because if you roll your eyes to stuff like that, like, wow, great story, key stuff just happened to pop in there at the right time, in a fiction, why would you not do so in a real-life scenario? To quote the usual suspects, convince me, convince me, verbal, convince me he did it. I want you to. Thank you for taking the time to watch this or read this or listen to this, depending on which one you're doing. And the title is correct. If you somehow have other pieces of evidence or information that I do not have, that one week chain link that shows me evidence or even plausibility that beyond a reasonable doubt that Stephen Avery committed this crime, then by all means, let me know. That's why I'm doing this. I want to know. 
For if he is guilty, to quote Tim Minchin, I will turn on a dime. You show me that it works and how it works, and when I've recovered from the shock, I will take a compass and carve fancy that on the side of my... <clears throat> well, you know the rest. But just like his own attorney said, I hope in some way that he is guilty because the thought of an innocent man being behind bars again for a crime he didn't commit is unbearable because the alternative to reference the movie Awakenings is unthinkable. I'm doing this because I know people who have been wrongly accused of things and were completely innocent. But the main reason I'm doing this is because it seems that a lot of people out there who should logically proclaim his innocence or at least his non-guilt are doing quite the opposite. I was on a site trying to gather more information about this case and in the comments I happened to see the name of somebody I know professionally. Someone who's smart, who's a business owner, an upstanding member of the community, and who obviously didn't put the pieces of the puzzle together the way I did. His conclusion was based on a single piece of evidence that was proven to be at least questionable. I also had the same response thus far from a, a prominent local member of the internet media and another member of the media whose prior profession and training should have them on the same page as me. The only reason why these people would have not drawn the same conclusion that I did was either one, they're biased, which I doubt, so that's pretty much out. Two, they have information that I do not have, which is kind of the point of this whole endeavor. Or three, they haven't put the pieces together yet. There is also a presumption of guilt that the media portrayed from almost day one. That's a huge factor. So knowing that with so many smart, logical people coming to the conclusion of guilty, even though I find it amazingly problematic, I can now see why the jury came to the verdict it did. I wish I could watch the whole trial and find out where things fell apart, but my haste studies have uncovered the fact that the defense might have had the carpet yanked out from under them via the State versus Denny ruling, forcing them to make the claim that they did of the cops were the one who did it and no one else was even remotely considered, giving them almost no chance of victory, furthering the possibility that this could be some conspiracy. So I implore you to listen to this in its entirety and prove me wrong. Just one piece of evidence that would say to me that beyond a reasonable doubt, against the mountain of evidence to the contrary, that would make me change my mind and say that Stephen Avery is indeed guilty. Now, I don't know Stephen Avery, so technically I could care less whether he lives, dies, or grows mushrooms out of his crack. But if he is innocent, again, and behind bars, then this is one of the worst modern atrocities that can happen in the land of the free. And the worst part about all this is that if he truly is innocent, the real murderer is out there free, just like the last time. And this, this new Stephen Avery fad, just like a new car, a new relationship, or a new puppy, the newness eventually wears off and the burdens of life start to creep back in. Life goes on and Stephen Avery will fall by the wayside, a possibly innocent man rotting in a cell while you make plans for where you have your next book club meeting. I make my life decisions off of what I see, then no, then hear, then guess, in that order. So when I'm presented with a story, I want to hear the other side. And if the other side doesn't persuade me with the facts, then I make my decision accordingly. This is especially important in this case because a man was in prison wrongfully once. From the time spanning, from the time you're born, to legal adulthood. That's a long time. From what I've been presented with, it would seem to me that Stephen Avery may very well be innocent, and at least not guilty, of murder. Now, before you judge me with no information, and if you just did, think about an instance where no one believed you, and if your freedom was contingent upon those same people having the same reaction that you're having to me, and I don't care if it's a case of when you were eight years old and your little brother broke that vase, but you got grounded for it, same principle. You may want to keep listening. And serious comments only, please. All right? If you're going to be that guy who I'm sure karma will never teach you a lesson, go find a hobby. And same for those who will correct me on the player salaries, it's to prove a point not to win a trivia contest on sportsnerd.sportsgeek.com. In the American legal system, you are presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Yet the verdict is either guilty or not guilty. If you run over somebody with your car, did you plan it or was it an accident? I mean, you ran them over, so you're not innocent, but are you guilty or not guilty of intentional homicide? Are you guilty or not guilty of manslaughter? The prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did it, not anything else. Not, well, you, the defense, have to prove that it was someone else other than the defendant. That's not the defense's job. That's the prosecutor's job. They're bringing the charge, and they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that person is guilty. That's why it's usually the state versus X. And any cop will tell you, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. 
But even then, if you know something, the evidence should at least state beyond a reasonable doubt to convince someone of something. Saying, I just know to something is not the way the court system is supposed to work, but I'm sure it happens all the time. Even given that notion, I remain unconvinced in this case. Juries and governments are made up of people, and people are fallible. Sometimes on purpose and maliciously, but most of the time, hopefully anyway, it's on accident. Any decision becomes less significant if it doesn't involve you. For this reason, juries have probably the greatest responsibility in the free world. A comedian once joked about the OJ trial and the long sequester of the jurors. He said, can you imagine being the lone holdout? Well, I think he's guilty. Shut up, man, we're going home! Oh, I'm sorry, I thought we were here for justice. Justice, my ass, we're getting five bucks a day! And in the movie 12 Angry Men, Jack Warden's character says, and I'm paraphrasing this, but it's basically, hey, you know, can we hurry this up? I got tickets to the baseball game tonight. Because it's not your life on the line, and in my life I'm living, I've got better things to do than sit here, so pfft. That can be a dangerous situation. Sometimes people do dumb things without explanation. I once worked with a guy who had his car window smashed so the thief could snatch two sodas from his front seat. Not even name brand sodas either, they were store brand sodas. Why would somebody do that? Well, it turns out it was a homeless man who was hungry and probably cold, so if he didn't get caught, hey, he got soda. If he did get caught, he got three hots and a cot, versus being hungry on a sidewalk bed. So even the illogical becomes logical when you find out the truth and add human nature to the equation. Sure, people do stupid things, but you're usually not going to sell your car for tickets to a concert i.e. get rid of a life necessity for some one-time event, or do something where the risk far outweighs the reward. The DA in this case, Ken Kratz, lost his position in order to sex some domestically abused girls. I'm only bringing that up because, rereading this, I don't talk about Ken Kratz a lot in this, but did anyone ever delve into whether or not Ken Kratz was at least taking prescription drugs during the trial? Any narcotic alters your brain chemistry, so was that the case during this trial? Even Ken Kratz said, and these are his words, it was deplorable behavior that went on in 2010, three years after the case. He fully admits it, which is good, and it also goes to character of admitting when you're wrong, but when did he start taking these drugs? I could swear I read 2009, but did this problem escalate over three months or three years? That question needs to be addressed in order to ad adequately gauge the effect or non-effects that this might have had in the Stephen Avery trial. But either way, regarding the decisions, most people will do dumb things only if the punishment is light, if they think they have a way out, which is probably what Ken Kratz was thinking, I'm the DA who's going to throw the hammer down on me, or the reward outweighs the risk. The only other option is that the risk is the only option. That being said, to start off, I'd like to address the block that most people would have in proclaiming Stephen Avery innocent with the defense's case, i.e. the police being adversely involved. You're thinking, well, how am I supposed to believe that the police killed this girl and planted evidence on an innocent man? Well, first off, the cops don't have to be murderers. Hell, they don't even have to be there planting the evidence, but it certainly smells of some sort of adverse involvement. But I can poke enough holes in the prosecution's case beyond that to which Stephen Avery should have been found not guilty. Remember, that is what the American legal system has to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt, he is guilty of the crime which he is charged. I can not only poke holes in this with the information I have, but I can also make a compelling argument to likely police involvement, possible police planning evidence, and even questionably, although doubtfully, having police involved in the actual death of Teresa Halbach using the evidence and human nature. To get your noggin out of the notion that cops or government, which remember are made up of people, couldn't possibly lie or set somebody up, I will preface with these five things. And I don't want to get too deep in the weeds to tie politics into this, but I'm going to state recent events because most people watching this, myself included, probably aren't old enough to remember things like Oliver North and the Iran-Contra affair, although that is a perfect example too, or at least old enough to be concerned with adult politics at the time. The first being this presidential administration telling everybody that Benghazi, the event was about a movie which later turned out to be knowingly false. Two, the Bo Bergdahl prisoner swap to which he was lauded as a hero. Now he's facing a court martial. Three, since this crime took place in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin John Doe investigation. Four, this next one pertains later to the FBI part in the case, but 
the United States Supreme Court emergency decision to postpone the voter ID requirement in the state of Wisconsin, even though the now defunct agency who was supposed to have it up and running said they couldn't get it done in time, even though they had a year and a half to do so, which is about the same time frame as it took for this crime in question here to have been committed and go to trial to give you, to give you kind of a perspective of how long that agency had to prepare, showing at least that if government wants to move fast for a specific reason and claimably unbiased purpose, they can. And last but not least, this fate timed incident. Number five, the TV show Crime Watch Daily, which I happened to catch this episode that was airing while I was cleaning two days before watching Making a Murderer. I saw the episode, which I later Googled. So if you want to Google, you, you can Google judge frames woman for refusing sexual advances. So if you Google that, you can watch the nine minute video that originally aired on September 28, 2015. Crime Watch Daily debuted this story, and look it up if you don't believe me, because it has striking similarities to the Avery case, where a judge by the name of Bryant Cochran from Chatsworth, Georgia, Murray County, framed Angela Garmley, an innocent woman for refusing his sexual advances, and he had fellow officers help him. He asked six other law enforcement officers to plant drugs before he found two officers that would do it, and not a one of the asked officers said a word. They're now sitting behind bars, but that was for revenge, not for saving one's ass for millions of dollars in damage. Revenge, simple revenge for him not having the opportunity to sample the honey from that bee. That's just one example. And this is something I just happened to catch personally on television. So for those of you who are skeptical and think that this can't happen, think again. Lots of people will say, well, I'm supposed to believe that the cops would be crooked instead of this two-bit criminal murdering a young woman in a murderous, lustful rage. Well, let me start off by giving you a hypothetical, which sounds more like what human nature would cause, okay? Imagine you want to write a fiction, all right? But you need to make the story as believable as possible, believable and realistic, all right? Leave out the concrete evidence in a case and pretend that the story is based off of human nature that's so realistic it could literally be real, so it could pass for basically nonfiction. Okay, that being said, which sounds more like a plausible story to you? Number one, a young man with a young family is wrongfully convicted of a terrible crime and under suspicious legal circumstances is sent to prison for 15 years, not getting to see his kids grow up, losing his freedom, with the actual offender still on the streets. Then, due to DNA evidence, he has his case overturned and he's set free. And for two years, two whole years, he does nothing heinous, lives a pretty normal life, has a fairly attractive girlfriend, i.e. he's getting some, and he's about to throw the hammer down on a community and individuals who are involved in his wrongful imprisonment some of which actions due to the nature of the incident are likely not to be covered by an insurance policy, which because of such basically states that the department or individuals involved may be on the hook themselves instead of having insurance pay for it. They'd be on the hook both monetarily and legally. As for monetarily, the departments might lose money and the individuals might lose their house, their savings, their pension, etc. So the community and individuals are both on the hook legally as well for the wrongful conviction of this innocent person. And most government officials are pretty well aware of what happens to the government officials in federal ass bang prison. So since he's about to throw the hammer down on them for a whopping, now keep in mind, the total I'm about to throw out is more than the combined total before taxes of the two highest paid athletes, at least at one time, in Wisconsin history. The highest paid player not only in Wisconsin history, but in NFL history, Wisconsin's own Green Bay Packer Aaron Rodgers at $22 million a year, and the highest paid Milwaukee Brewer in history, Ryan Braun, at $13.4 million a year. Those total to $35.4 million. This fictional character was about to get $36 million in a lawsuit, more than the two highest paid athletes in Wisconsin history, and unless the game was rigged, would have probably more than likely won that case. Having more money than those two players and more money than most people could possibly imagine and being able to buy anything and frankly pretty much any woman he wanted, including Wisconsin's own Susie Favor Hamilton, instead of two years of behaving even though he was only around violent offender males for 18 years for something he didn't do and even though he has a fairly attractive girlfriend, out of sheer lust, he kidnaps, rapes, and kills a car photographer by shooting her in a messy ass garage with hundreds of different pieces lying around. Then somehow this redneck Dexter cleans up every drop of blood off of every piece of junk that was in that messy ass garage, but forgets the bullet, burns her body to get rid of the evidence, but somehow doesn't crush the car in the car crusher mere feet away from where it was stashed, 
and or burn the car, then forgets about the key, which just happens to be in plain sight, forgets about all those few but only pieces of key evidence that could put him back behind the very bars he was behind wrongfully for all those years, and forget to do all that evidence destruction for five days, mind you, then consents to a search of his property where police conveniently find all those things, which, let's face it, is kind of like bringing a hooker home while the wife is away and you change the bed sheets but leave her wig, lingerie, and a used condom on the floor. Or is this more plausible? Some fictional LEOs or law enforcement officers and government officials who wrongfully convicted an innocent man for 18 years who had the chance eight years before to bring that fact up to a court so that he might be let out after 10 years but didn't, to which the wrongfully imprisoned individual has evidence of this. So on top of the wrongful conviction, the LEOs probably would have lost this almost slam dunk case against them. Again, with the department on the hook for all that money, the insurance policy probably wouldn't cover it. And aside from that fact, the department would be out whatever money to distance themselves. The department probably would have taken those individuals and fired them. Yanked their pension, left them to pay their own legal fees, probably forcing them to lose their house and their savings, and more than likely having them go to court for legal misconduct, only to wind up as law enforcement officers and government officials in federal ass bank prison. Wouldn't have thought to roll the dice to do something drastic to save their skins? Not necessarily to kill, although a man with nothing has nothing to lose, but to assist in making sure that the reason that their lives are about to be shattered, i.e. the wrongfully imprisoned individual goes back to prison for another crime he didn't commit, by helping them in his prosecution along with the case to put the guy who spent most of his life behind bars back behind bars because, hey, even though he may be innocent, he's been there before. It's either that or lose everything I've ever worked for, possibly go to federal ass bang prison and have my family out on the street. So that versus a wrongfully convicted guy who's been in prison for 18 years, been out for two, behaving himself, about to get $36 million, gets a wild, lustful, murderous hair in his ass, and then burns the one piece of evidence on his own property while leaving the other three key pieces of evidence in plain sight to bury him? See, this is what I have a hard time believing, minus the evidence itself even, and yet I see numerous other people believing just that. Which is a more plausible scenario given human nature, given your own observations of people in your life, and given the examples of true events I mentioned before? Which sounds more legit? People in power trying to cover up a mistake as to not lose everything they have, including their own freedom? Or some guy about to collect big, going on a lustful, murderous rage, after two years of behaving, all but guaranteeing he'd be back in the place he was wrongfully convicted to spend most of his life? Remember, Two former Illinois governors are currently wearing orange jumpsuits and making license plates. Forget any evidence. Which is more plausible? What we say we'd never do versus what we would realistically do given limited options or even rare options are very different. People will hypothetically say, strip naked and run across the street and back, not for a million dollars. Please, if somebody had $9,000 cash money in hand, just four figures, mind you, not seven. In cold, hard cash in front of you right now, unless it's freezing out, or you make $100,000 a year, you would more than likely strip, run, and take the money. Even if your salary is $100,000 a year, that's a month's take-home pay for a minute's worth of work. And if you still said no, I guarantee you, if I were to go back and talk to people you knew in high school and college and ask them about some of the stuff you did back then for free, you'd probably have to recant. Not all, but most. With that being said, since I have yet to hear anyone analyze this aspect of the case, and just this aspect of the case, not to mention the actual physical evidence, let's get to the evidence and some plausibility discussions there. Granted, some of the ideas and theories I present are highly circumstantial at best, but so is what they used to convict Stephen Avery. Before I delve into this, I want to bring up something that most people have never experienced. When someone commits a murder, unless they've done it before or unless they're a complete sociopath, people who commit murder soon afterwards tend to go through what some in law enforcement refer to as the full tilt boogie, a condition where your adrenaline and emotional state of committing the crime has worn off and you now understand what happened and the consequences of what happened. It finally hits you. In that scenario, the murderer basically freaks out and just like a person trying to cover something up, like say somebody trying marijuana for the first time, you know, the, oh, everyone knows, man, everyone knows, or some adulterers trying to hide their actions by upping the sex life frequency or veracity with their own partner, the murderer has a tendency to overcompensate their actions in order to appear normal. 
you can see that they're freaked out, but they will do things that they think will hide their emotional state when in fact, the opposite is true. I was working for a company as a sales guy, let's say company A, in 2006. One of my accounts was company B, that I almost worked for, believe it or not, one of the victims in an eventual murder who I'll call Earl, whom I knew from around town. He gave me his card and told me to call him if I wanted a job at company B since he knew the manager. But three days later, company A called and I ended up working there with company B coincidentally being one of my sales accounts. During that time, I built up a rapport with the staff and the manager of company B who we'll call Dan. And I'd see Earl from time to time. Dan made the decisions, so I spent most of my weekly sales call time talking to him. Dan was a pretty cool dude, and quite frankly, one of the nicest guys you'd ever meet. Funny, energetic, fun guy. Dan wore t-shirts and jeans due to the nature of the business, and if necessary, he'd wear a polo shirt if he would need to dress up. One typical Wednesday, I make a scheduled stop and pop in around 10 a.m. And Dan is not only wearing dress pants and dress shoes, but also a button-up silk shirt and a tie. Well, I noticed that right away because it was something different and because it was really out of character for him. He was also beat red, sweating and looking like somebody who might have worked at NASA during the Apollo 13 crisis. You know how people react when they get a phone call that someone had an accident or is in the hospital or, or had a stroke or a heart attack? Basically, that was his demeanor. And I said, you know, hey man, you all right? You look kind of stressed out. You got the big bosses coming or something? And he basically, yeah, yeah, man, I got the bosses coming. Oh, I got a lot of stuff to do. I said, all right, well, you know, I'll check the stock, make sure it's all good, and I'll see you next week. Not really thinking much of it. The next day, I go to my company's hub to pick something up. And you know how workplaces usually have that one newspaper that the co-workers will pass around? And you know how if you fold a paper into a long section, like what somebody would be reading if they're standing in a subway, holding it one hand? Well, in one of the most unbelievably coincidental moments I've ever encountered, as I'm leaning on the chest high counter, waiting for my stuff, there, sitting folded to the quarter page, to the exact article on the waiting room counter, right in front of my face, is a newspaper article with Earl's name and picture on it, and the headline read, Murdered. I couldn't believe it. Come to find out, even though Dan was a registered sex offender who did time for a sexual assault, a violent one at that, he was also the father of Earl's niece. Dan, being an actual pretty nice guy, was apparently trying to help Earl out because Earl was having trouble finding an apartment because apparently Earl had some trouble in the past with child porn. Well, in an argument obviously turned sour at about 2 a.m. that same Wednesday, eight hours before I saw Dan, Dan apparently got mad at his child's grandmother for something and beat her to death with a bat. He also did the same thing to Earl, who was trying to defend his mother. And when the wooden bat broke over Earl's head from the ferocity of the attack, since Earl wasn't dead yet, Dan went and got a utility knife and slit Earl's throat, leaving them there for the mother of his own child to find her mother and brothers beaten, bloody, and lifeless bodies. Needless to say, Dan is now serving life behind bars with no possibility of parole, as it should be. But the point I'm trying to make is that I saw the full tilt boogie with my own two eyes. It all fell into place after the fact, and luckily, not many people have experienced that to know what to look for in a situation like that. But none of the people, including Stephen Avery or Brendan Dassey, to me, look like somebody who just committed a horrific crime like that to somebody, especially when just days before, Stephen Avery was emotional at a state testimony talking about not seeing his kids grow up, or Brandon Dassey flashbacking to the supposed crime. Sure, they could have hit it, but... One thing I've learned in my time on this planet, especially with the internet around, is that anyone is capable of anything at any time. But there is almost always a reaction and or consequence to that, and I have yet to see anything of the sort in this case so far. In fact, it seems to me to be the case more in other stories that I've read that are mentioned a little later that describe the potential suspects in this case going through a full tilt boogie. And the one group of people who would be trained and immune not to react to such human nature would be active duty combat soldiers and cops. But again, the whole point of this defense is not to point out who did it, only to point out that Stephen Avery didn't do it, or if somebody has evidence to the contrary, to provide that. Something that I feel needs mentioning is what's called MMO, means motive opportunity. Most suspects have means and opportunity, but motive is usually the clincher. 
On most crime shows, that's the last piece of the puzzle. Why? Why do they do it? The physical evidence will usually point them to a person. It gives investigators the what. But if they have the motive, then that's usually what makes the case because it gives them the why. And sometimes it's what starts them down the road to the real suspect. The guy was having an affair. The wife took out a huge insurance policy. The guy was three times locked up in the psych ward. These bring the means and opportunity into perspective. Remember, in anything in nature and life, it usually follows this rule, the ECP. Exist, coincidence, pattern. One time, one piece or one part is proof of existence. Two times pieces or parts, that's proof of at least a coincidence. But three times pieces or parts is by definition creating a pattern. This is why Brandon Dassey's statement is so important. Even when those supposedly gory details finally came out, there was still no motive as to why they killed her. Although if you point the accusation towards the cops, that is the biggest piece of the puzzle. Motives. All 36 million of them. For the prosecution, all it gives them is a horrific narrative to tell and to stack on more charges. If any of you, especially in the great drinking state that is Wisconsin, a state and culture that has its only Major League Baseball team and the biggest city associated with beer and shirts that say drink Wisconsinably, and to which comedians like Louis Black comment on is no less than wincingly impressive, if you've ever been pulled over for a DUI, you'll always get two different charges against you so they can nail you on at least one of them. But, as stated by Stephen Avery's defense attorney, Dean Strang, in order for the defense to win, they have to run the board and win on all counts. The state only has to get you on one to lock you away for a long time. So why did the defense go after the cops so hard instead of just trying to point to some other people with means, motive, and opportunity to possibly implicate them? If you look up the case on Reddit, somebody posted a link on this and it seems that the reason the defense went towards the cops so hard is that the prosecution successfully argued to enact the Denny Clause during the pretrial, which comes from the legal precedent, and if I'm wrong on this, by all means let me know, but if I understand this correctly, it basically states that you can't accuse others of this crime on the stand because there were just too many people involved with no real access or at least questionable access to any of this evidence to commit the crime that the court would just be wasting its time bringing all of them up to the stand. Makes sense if you have, which I think the Denny case was similar to, 50 or 100 people who are drug users and dealers coming in and out of a house and you're trying to point the finger at one of them to say, hey look, it could have been any one of these druggies coming in and out of this house. But that certainly wasn't the case with this murder Yet, that's what the court ruled for the prosecution. Yet another notch on the bedpost of bull that makes it even more arguable that this conspiracy theory indeed exists. Remember, the judge in Georgia was involved with eight other officers in order to frame Angie Garmley. That ruling coupled with his parents not being able to put their property up for bail. Even with all those at least eyebrow-raising actions, there are still quite a few people who seem to think, the judge didn't seem biased to me. It sure seems to me to make it all the more evident that this was a rigged game. I'm actually curious if people in Wisconsin who think the cops couldn't rig this case would also think that the Seattle game when the NFL officials were on strike wasn't rigged. Packers? Of course, damn officials. The game was rigged. But some poor dude getting screwed by the legal system? No, nope. couldn't happen. And now we come to the points of evidence, but also 14 things left out of the film that were written in an article. I'll address these 14 points first. Reason being is that these points were supposedly left out of the film, which leaned towards Stephen Avery's guilt. But the real reason I want to address this is because it seems that this is where most people take these points at face value without exploring any other possibilities that change their minds back from Stephen Avery being innocent to Stephen Avery again being guilty. So even though I'm going to address the 14 points in the article first, I'm going to list the evidence first, then list the 14 points, then go into the analysis of the 14 points. The evidence points. One, the RAV4 being on the property. Two, Stephen Avery's blood being in the RAV4. Three, Stephen Avery's sweat on the latch and the hood of the RAV4. Four, the burnt bones on the property. Five, Teresa Hallbach's DNA being found on one piece of bone, the tibia bone, which still had muscle tissue on it. Six, the key being found in the house. Seven, Stephen Avery's sweat being on that key. 8. The testimony of Brendan Dassey about the rape and the murder. 9. The mattress, the shackles, the bed, the garage, the knife, the mutilation tools, i.e. the physical evidence of the crime, or lack thereof. 10. The bullet fragment with Teresa Hallbach's DNA on it. And 11. The bullet that came from Stephen Avery's gun.
The 14 points that were posted online by On Milwaukee that were supposedly left out of making a murderer, they are, and in order, one, the fact that Stephen Avery had leg shackles and handcuffs, two, the tumultuous relationship he had with his girlfriend Jody, three, the key had sweat on it, even though they did mention that in the trial, four, Dassey helped clean the garage, five, the pornography recovered at Stephen Avery's residence, six, the previous cruelty to animals, Seven, he drew a torture chamber and was allegedly involved in assault on other girls. Eight, he answered the door wearing a towel. Nine, called specifically to request Teresa Halbach that day. Ten, he called Teresa Halbach's phone three times, twice using star 67. Eleven, he used a false name. Twelve, bone fragments found with steel radio belts in the same fire pit. Thirteen, sweat on the hood latch, which will be discussed in the evidence portion. And 14, the Avery bullet that had Teresa Hobbock's DNA on it, that will also be discussed in the evidence portion. So now let's delve into the analysis of the 14 points made by On Milwaukee. Point number one, Stephen Avery had leg shackles, handcuffs, and chain. So what? There was none of Teresa Hobbock's DNA on any of it. Adult stores don't exist and stay in business for no reason, especially in the age of the free internet, i.e. people go into those stores and purchase items. Lots of people. Look up Ovipositor once. It advertises in Playboy. For those of you who remember the movie franchise Aliens, you can now get a toy with an alien-shaped, how should I say, pregnancy delivery device where you can deposit gel alien eggs into your person. For those of you out there with a fetish who like to be impregnated by giant exoskeletal aliens, I myself would like to see their balance sheet to see how many people on this planet would spend hard-earned cash to try this thing out. Yet, Stephen Avery is questioned because he had some... Leg shackles? I was fairly recently at a bar for a party, and there was someone there who was telling a story about a friend of theirs who was an EMT, and she was called to a scene where two older gentlemen who met on Craigslist were fully gimped out, Pulp Fiction style, with openings cut in the back of the pants like Prince's pants on the MTV Video Music Awards years ago, and one of the guys answered the door for the EMTs still fully gimped out. They were tying each other up like a pinata, and as I quote from the storyteller, testing out various items on one another that can only be described as instruments of destruction. And one of the men, the current piñata, had a heart attack and died mid-fun. This event happened less than three blocks from where I was sitting at the time listening to this story. No one ever heard of that one. I didn't at least until that moment. Yet Stephen Avery is questioned because he has some... leg shackles? Having kinky toys means nothing, especially when there's no evidence that ties it to anything. See what I did there? Ties? Yeah. Point number two. Stephen Avery had a tumultuous relationship with his girlfriend. Again, so what? Lots of people had that. He had a tumultuous relationship with his girlfriend. Big deal. He was in prison for 18 years, surrounded by dudes who probably didn't handle their differences by talking it out. Remember the movie Blow, where Penelope Cruz, Johnny Depp's wife in the movie, tells the cop that there's cocaine in the car simply because she was mad at him at the moment, even though she would be on the hook too. Also remember Jody, Stephen Avery's fiance, was doing time for a DUI. So back in 2005, it was probably at least her third offense. And if she got seven months for it, it would probably indicate that she's at least a heavy drinker or possibly an alcoholic. So was she drunk when they got into these tiffs? Was he? Obviously nothing really came of it, so I'm guessing it was nothing at all, but I'm sure it was mentioned to go to character so the media could write an article. Point 2B. Also, if your spouse, regardless of gender, even though, depending on certain circumstances, the authorities will have a tendency to lean towards males harder than females, and I recently saw a post about this on how a couple did a test by filming in public places and beating on one another that people would actively stop a man from hitting a woman in public, but not the other way around. But, regardless of gender, if your spouse is damaging your property, burning your clothes, smashing your car with a golf club, legally, you can be arrested and charged with domestic abuse. Was Jody ever accused of such actions? Was it Stephen Avery who called the cops, yet both of their names are on the reports? Possible. Number three, the key had Stephen Avery's sweat on it. Again, they did mention that, but how could a cloth key that she had for six years have absolutely none of her DNA on it, but yet his sweat is on there? Also, I could swear I saw a pic of this somewhere. I'm almost positive I saw something where the necklace part of the lanyard was there too. Blue with white lettering. If somebody has that, please let me know or link to it. Who ultimately had that lanyard? Wouldn't that be the key to her killer? No pun intended. 
Would that not have her DNA on it? That being said, if it did have her DNA on it, why would the neck part of the lanyard have her DNA on it, but the key would not? If the key part had Stephen Avery's DNA on it, but the lanyard did not, wouldn't that be a little bit of a strange finding too? Did they ever discuss that? Who found and or had the neck part of the lanyard? Am I correct in saying that this lanyard part existed or was this a figment of my imagination? Besides, where are her other keys? Like the ones in the picture of her standing by the driver door of her car. Doesn't she have a house key? Does she have any other keys like a garage key, a work key, a key fob? Where the hell are those? So Stephen Avery is going to successfully get rid of those keys but keep the one key that ties him to the one legitimate piece of evidence of Teresa Halbach? Not to mention, how pointless would the key be if the battery cables were disconnected because having that key wouldn't start the car. Part B. The key was found on the seventh search by James Lank, who was recently deposed and certainly not supposed to be there. This is pretty much common knowledge, but it's worth stating. This right here should be enough to sway anyone that something fishy was going on. Obviously not to everyone, which is another reason why I'm making this. If this key was found on even the second search and or somewhere other than in plain sight, I wouldn't be making this. Also, since we're talking about Stephen Avery's sweat, I know that the battery cable was supposedly disconnected for the biggest of unknown reasons of this case, to me anyway. But out of all those pieces of evidence, this key pretty much indicates a plant. That means they had the key. Someone had the key. Even Deputy Kucharski blurted out on the stand to which the prosecution had to object to the statement of his own witness. I'll say that again because this is really important to the case. How did the car get on the Avery property? It is the only other piece of evidence with Teresa Halbach's DNA via blood in the cargo bay, which looks like it was matted hair with blood, which indicates that she was shot in the head or at least bludgeoned and put in the back of her own car. How did the cops have that key? Because of that, it's plausible that Stephen Avery absolutely did not touch that key and the cops did. If a cop had a key, then a cop moved the car. If a cop moved the car, then a cop saw a dead body and the cop planted evidence. No other option makes sense. Granted, this is not evidence that a cop murdered her, but what was the bullet caliber size of the hole in the skull where the gunshot wound was on Teresa Holbach? And were they able to tell if the injury was paramortem or postmortem? Those two questions were never answered, and that to me is going to be key in making a defense to say perhaps Stephen Avery was not the shooter with a 22 rifle, but that's a different segment. All right, if the caliber size was mentioned at one point in time, please let me know. But there's a kicker here that really gives me to these bones. Deputy Daniel Kucharski of the Calumet County Sheriff's Office, who was not told that day like the other deputy was that he was supposed to watch the Manitowoc County LEOs so they don't ensue a conflict of interest. And even after he entered the trailer for the first time, the key clearly wasn't there by his own testimony. When asked about the day he was babysitting the two Manitowoc County Sheriffs who were deposed in the Stephen Avery lawsuit, the day that the key was found. When asked by the prosecution why he thought that there was no way that those law enforcement officers could have planted the key, his response had to be objected to by the very prosecution that asked the question. He said, well, first they'd have to have the key. I think the only person who would have the key is the person who killed Teresa. I'll say it again. Go watch it if you don't believe me. I think the only person who would have the key was the person who killed Teresa. Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. Move to strike. The judge forbade the jury from considering that in deliberations. Bam! That technically should have opened everybody's eyes, but yet there are still some sitting listening to this right now who believe that it was this stupid hick boy that killed this girl. Number four, Dassey helped clean the garage. Before I comment on him, I want to comment on something else involving him. He doesn't seem to know what is up, and I hear the story that basically Stephen Avery molested his nephews when they were young. Well, first off, after 18 years in prison, his nephews either weren't born yet or certainly weren't old enough to remember anything like that if he did it back then. I mean, do the math. Not to say that it didn't happen somehow after he got out or anything, but by the time he was put in prison, Brendan Dassey wasn't born yet. And Brendan Dassey, being the youngest, was 14 when he got out. I read the transcript regarding the supposed touching, and if you take that transcript literally, you'd better hope your spouse doesn't take the same literal translation to mistletoe belt buckles because it'll turn you guys into instant swingers. All right, when he said he touched me where I felt uncomfortable, 
Generally, we know what that means. But his mom was there and she said, well, when you guys were goofing around, I was there. I.e., that's not what that phrase means, Brendan. You know, the kid who didn't understand the meaning of the word inconsistent? Kind of like Benny, the mentally challenged guy from the show L.A. Law in the episode where he thought he had to go to jail because he was bad when being bad meant he saw sex. And that brings up another point really quick is that was that really what was on Brenda Dessie's mind? Did Steven really show him porno and he didn't know how to handle it? But that's for another time. Brenda Dessy also said something about Stephen Avery touching a girl he was going with in the basement, of course, with other people around down there at the same time. So Stephen Avery was touching a girl in a bad place, but three or four other people just watched. Sounds like Brendan really doesn't know what's going on. Also, it sounds like most movies with a drama tension twist that in real life could be averted with one simple question. Granted, I suppose that all that goes to, to interpretation, but in the transcript, they didn't go past that. So as far as I'm concerned, until someone comes out and states on record that Stephen Avery touched my privates in a sexual manner and I don't like it and I felt uncomfortable. I think the argument is kind of a moot point. Part B. Did you see how much junk was in that garage? If someone were shot in that garage, especially in the head, there would be blood spatter and brains everywhere. Just go on YouTube and watch people shoot handguns at watermelons, apples, milk containers. Even at 10 feet away, they get soaked. There would be blood, brains, and tissues all over them. And that's the other thing. If all this bad stuff happened and they cleaned up the gore, they somehow forgot to get rid of all the other key pieces of evidence. Most of the time, the thing that does a murderer in when it comes to blood spatter is their shoes. People have many shirts, many pairs of pants, but not many pairs of shoes. Well, guys anyway. And if there was spatter on there, it should at least be on their shoes. Blood spatter may be fairly easily cleaned up to the naked eye off a wall, but in a garage where there's piles of junk on workbenches on all three sides of that garage? No. The cops were there for eight days. Avery, who couldn't remember after five days to crush a victim's car, and Brendan Dassey, who thought that he was going to get back to school that same day after confessing to a murder somehow cleaned every drop of blood off all those parts? Did the cops look at every single one of those parts for blood and put them back in that messy heap just as they were when they found them so the stuff didn't fall onto the floor? No, they didn't and I'll tell you why. The story was made up. They didn't touch anything in that garage because there was no evidence there to touch. The only reason the garage even came into play was because the bullet casings were there in the garage so they had to have some way to make it fit their narrative. They got Brendan Dassey to say it happened in the garage, and even with no blood spatter, they magically found the bullet. Contaminated bullet, mind you. And don't forget that the cops have this chemical called luminol that you can spray all around on everything, and even if blood has been cleaned with bleach and is gone from sight of the naked eye and the DNA has been denatured and destroyed and rendered unusable for testing, well, luminol will show blood stains with a black light that has long since been cleaned. You ever have a mustard stain on a black shirt that came out in the wash and then walked into a room with a black light? It even has the yellow tint to it still. Yet luminol on a high profile case like this wasn't used in a garage or anywhere at all for that matter, even after they found the bullet. You'd think that to corroborate a shooting in the garage where a bullet was found that you'd for sure want to find blood or blood spatter to support a story, any blood at all. But in truth, they had to roll with what they had and it somehow worked. They had smoke with no fire and a jury believed their magic show. On the other hand, I know that no one ever pulled a rabbit out of a hat without first putting the rabbit in there. Number five, porn recovered at the residence. Come on, he's a guy. He was in prison looking at dudes and no women for 18 years. Long enough to where if you go to prison on the day you were born, by the time you get released, you're old enough to buy, wait for it, porn. If he didn't have porn, I'd worry. The fact that this was even on the list goes to show how far the media will go to perpetuate a story and for what? Ratings. The exact same thing that made him guilty before that jury even walked into the room. You can make the case that it goes to character, but I'd like to see these reporters be as candid with their own sexual liaisons or porn viewing and or buying and see how fairly the viewers and employees would look upon them regarding their character, even though it's completely legal. You can be trained to kill somebody with a ballpoint pen. Point is that even a pen, the most vapid thing, can be used maliciously, which is what they did here. This shouldn't have been on the list. Part 6. Previous Cruelty to Animals Yeah, okay, this one was a lot worse than they let on. 
Apparently someone, not him, according to Stephen Avery anyway, threw the cat over the fire versus in the fire. But if a cat is doused with a flammable liquid, it's probably going to immolate. But he was young and probably drunk, and like most young drunk people, it was a stupid thing to do. Assuming, of course, that it was Stephen Avery who did it. Remember, he said it was not him. It doesn't really make it any better, but I'm sure that this is where the plethora of non-case comments are going to go bye-bye. But honestly, country folk look at animals differently than city folk who have never seen meat outside of saran wrap. It's just true, at least from my observations anyway. Did this cat even have a name, like Cecil the Lion? Probably not. I doubt the country folk reacted to Cecil the same way city folk did here in America. It's probably more along the lines of that biochemist from Zimbabwe who wrote the article entitled, In Zimbabwe, We Don't Cry for Lions. It probably was an outdoor cat, and if the Averys were asked, it wouldn't even have a name, but they'd probably say, oh yeah, okay, that's our cat. Again, it doesn't make it any better, but it at least goes to a mindset of why it may have happened other than an excuse that he's a murderous lunatic. Number seven, he drew a torture chamber and was alleged by other girls for assault. All right, part A. Don't forget, as with any of the other allegations, they went nowhere. Okay, his fiance said he confessed to assaulting a girl. Okay, why did they not hit him with that too? Was she drunk when he told her this? He had been confused with Gregory Allen before, so who's to say that Allen wasn't the real culprit in the rest of these where Avery was suspected? If he was more of a suspect in those, then there would have been more to it, especially if the sheriff was supposedly out for him, wouldn't you say? Part B. Again, I'll cite the movie Blow. She gets him locked up for a while by telling the cop that there were drugs in the car simply because she was mad at him at that moment. Part C. People are into kinky things, as laid out by the Gimp story and the alien contraceptive device. Heck, there's a scene in the movie Blow itself where he details that she was the perfect mate because they both shared the same love of kinky things. Stephen Avery's old man built a fish farm in a large shed, but where was his torture chamber? Perfect spot to rape and slit throats, wouldn't you say? Yet, after having two years to build such a thing, nothing. Part D. One more thing. If he is having or has had twisted thoughts, if that's a crime, then Wes Craven and Stephen King would have a combined sentence of about a million years. Number eight. He answered the door in a towel. A towel? Really? This one is huge. Everyone is making a big deal of this, but did anyone ever use their brain? Maybe he just got out of the shower. You know that thing that the sheriff had to give him those few times he was arrested because he smelled so bad? Maybe his fiance said, you stank, wash up or you ain't getting any. Okay, I've answered the door in a towel, not by choice, but by timing. So does that mean I'm supposedly obsessed with whoever knocked on the door? My friend's drop dead gorgeous older sister once answered the door, dripping wet with a towel on. Does that mean she was clearly obsessed with me? God, I hope so. Part C. How many times did this occur? Once or numerous times? Multiple times? Sure, I can understand that. Or if it was different times of the day, i.e. something other than she'd always catch him in a towel after he got home from work and was showering at the same time every single day. Now, I'd say there's more to it, but from everything I've seen, it seems like it was pretty much just once. In which case, how could you possibly draw another conclusion? Number nine, he called specifically to request Teresa Hallback that day. The film shows that she calls and leaves a voicemail for somebody from her phone trying to schedule a time. So would he not call her back multiple times if she didn't answer? Stephen Avery had her cell phone number, which is proven by her cell phone records. And yet he had to call her boss to specifically request her. That's like calling your girlfriend's mom to tell her to call your girlfriend to have her call you. It doesn't make any sense. Even so, assuming that this was the case, would he be the first guy who would rather have a pretty girl come out to do a job instead of a dude? I know guys who get their car serviced at a certain shop on a certain day because that's when a certain hot chick works. Their words, not mine. Walk into an auto dealership nowadays. The service advisors and even sometimes the sales staff are more and more becoming young, attractive women. Did you catch that? Auto dealerships. Teresa Halbach worked for Auto Trader magazine. If you look for something to buy online and within an hour, the next unrelated site that you go to has a pop-up ad for the product that you were just looking at. Somebody tracks that. Even if it's a product that I've never looked at, I will get ads pop up for things at least pertaining to my demographic. I'll see ads pop up for brake rotors, but I've yet to see one for a designer handbag or fuzzy boots. So companies that are hired to increase the sales in brick and mortar stores aren't aware of the demographics like online sites? 
I'm sure that Teresa Halbach was a good photographer, but the auto industry has always been predominantly male, as the group most interested in cars, ergo the demographic that is generally more in tune with the inner workings of an automobile. Males. Statistically, males are the ones who bring in the car for the repairs, or at least major repairs. So when the salesperson tells them about the repairs that are needed, they have an idea of what's going on and they don't get shafted. And don't think this is some sexist blah blah. It's statistical proof that men prefer cars just as women prefer shoes. If you don't believe me, choose 10 car lots in your area at random and go to them. Almost all of them will be run by a guy. Then go to 10 random dealerships and you will see more and more women at the service counter. Since men are more likely to be the ones interested, ergo more familiar with what's under the hood of a car to take the car in for repairs, what better way to make the sale than putting young attractive females at the service counter? And why not? Car knowledge is not gender specific, it's a factor of learning. People who sell cars just like any other business want to cut costs. So wouldn't it be in Auto Trader Magazine's best interest to have a good looking photographer come out to take pictures in a male dominated industry instead of a guy? That way at least maybe they'd have a reason for these predominantly male car sellers to spend money to advertise their wares in the magazine versus the clients doing it for free on their own or word of mouth. I'm sure some of you are just seething, but it's reality. Trust me, it does happen. Anyone who has ever worked in pharmaceutical sales will tell you the exact same thing. The job I prior mentioned had me also going to auto dealerships. One time I walked into a dealership that I hadn't been to in months and it had four service desks all being manned, or shall I say woman, by young, attractive women. Now, I noticed this right off the bat because of how out of the norm it was. And this was back around the same year of the Stephen Avery trial. During my waiting for the manager, I overheard one of the woman's sales reps recommending to a customer that he needed a new rack and pin ion. For those of you who just laughed know that it's a rack and pinion, and at the dealership, that's about a two to $3,000 job. The woman selling the job had no idea what she was talking about, which is amazing considering that the dealerships make money in only three ways, selling cars, selling service, and selling parts. Parts are a minuscule percentage of a dealership's profit, so that leaves cars and service. Yet this dealership chose to supplant the four prior employees with car knowledge, basically four older dudes that it had there before when I was there last, with these four young women, at least one of which knew nothing about cars, which is remarkable for any business to endeavor doing. 25% of your on-force sales force knowing nothing about your product. But over time, that same sales force will eventually know what the prior team did. The point is, don't discount the fact that Stephen Avery was probably not the only one asking for Teresa Halbach to come out and take pictures of cars, especially if she was single, and that the company knew that demographic aspect to be a factor in generating business. Part D. Then again, and I'm sure this was a factor of her employment at the magazine too, but perhaps Stephen Avery liked her work better. Perhaps she was just that phenomenal of a photographer. Just as plausible as the hotness factor, but perhaps she took shots with better angles or better lighting, or perhaps she would take shots that avoided the customer seeing scratches or dents or rust. Perhaps she had better equipment or knew how to use it better or knew how to make the cars look better with graphics software. Part E, he called her repeatedly. Okay, how many times is repeatedly? An auto garage calls an auto parts store several times a day. Does that mean the auto garage's employees are obviously obsessed with the workers of the auto parts store? I can tell you from personal experience that every auto parts store has at least that one guy or girl that everybody wants to talk to because he's the only guy who really knows his job. And I guarantee you these guys aren't getting their phone calls based on their looks. It was stated that Stephen Avery called her or called for her several times. Several, it said. Several three, several five, several seven, several 77? Over what time frame? This is over probably the course of two years since he was working at the family business for those two years, I'm guessing. How often were the calls and were most of them legit? I'd think so, although there probably would have been some proof to the contrary. Did he creep her up because of the towel? Did he creep her up because the towel was the last straw? Or did uh, he just creep her out altogether? Right? When did she make the request not to come back? A week? A month? A year before? Two years before? No one's ever answered these questions yet. It would go pretty far to either proving or disproving the character accusations, don't you think? And again, this gets me. The towel called her multiple times. I mean, sure, they're trying to say it goes to character, but if this were any other situation, it wouldn't even be thought of. This is the problem with the media hype. And the main point of this, to me anyway, her boss sent her out there repeatedly, supposedly, even after she said she didn't want to go out there anymore because she felt creeped out or uncomfortable. 
Shouldn't then said boss be on the hook for this whole thing if you're using the same logic as you would to think that all the circumstantial evidence that you're using to pin the tail on Stephen Avery would conclude, right? I mean, that boss technically could have prevented this then. A boss wouldn't send a young woman back out to a place she made known she felt uncomfortable unless, one, they were completely uncaring about the safety of their employee, two, if the complaint didn't seem warranted. E.g., okay, a guy came out of towel. Did he flash you? No. Well, did he say, hey, want some of this or something like that? No. Well, sorry, get back out there and do your job. Which is logically most likely what happened. If not, that needs to be looked into. That boss needs to be looked into. Even so, supposedly she was an independent contractor, a 1099 worker. She could have refused to go out there if she wanted to. And why didn't the company send anyone else? It's noted that Stephen Avery called and specifically asked for her. By definition, that means Auto Trader Magazine had other people to send out. If Teresa Holbach was the only photographer that Auto Trader Magazine had, then the obsession argument is the worst kind of unsubstantiated, argumentative media hype that you can have. Unless the Avery Yard was the only or main business she worked with, in which case there would probably have been more calls. Granted, I don't know, but what other option is there? Did anyone ever follow up with that? Number 10. He called Teresa Hallbach's phone three times, two times using Star 67. Okay, three times, whatever. They're business dealings. But Star 67, I can at least see where this might raise suspicions. However, did he use Star 67 on the first, the second, or the third time? He was something of a celebrity. It was a small town, after all. Perhaps he got a new number and wanted to keep it private. Still needed to call her and was pressed for time, so he used his new phone instead of the main phone and used Star 67 to hide his number. Don't know, since I don't have all the details regarding Teresa Hallbach's phone records, but with this whole endeavor, I'm trying to think outside the box. In the film, there was a voicemail left for the auto salvage by Teresa Hallbach stating that she would like to come out to photograph a vehicle and it would probably be around 2 p.m. or even later. Did she ever call back? Seems to me that if I'm trying to call somebody back, that I would call numerous times too, especially if they didn't pick up. She said after two or even later. When did he call her? She was supposedly out there at 2.45 according to Bobby Dassey and 3 to 3.40 according to the bus driver. Well after 2 p.m. It would make no sense if he didn't call her that day. Again, did she ever answer? And if he knew that she didn't like him, maybe that's why he used Star 67. Plausible. Part D. Again, why does he have her cell phone number even though they talk about him calling asking specifically for her to come out, which would indicate that he would be talking to the boss and not her? The same boss that should have forbade her from going there or suggested that she not go back there if she supposedly felt uncomfortable, but I digress. Part E. Maybe he called her three times because he didn't want to miss her because he was going to be busy doing something else at the same time or was in a hurry to do something else later that day. Or perhaps he wanted the fan in the next issue and the deadline was at the end of the month. It was October 31st after all. Maybe since it was his sister Barb's car, his sister was nagging him to get it sold. Was Barb Jonda in need of fast money? I'm sure nobody listening to this has ever had that situation. Pawn Stars isn't a hit show for nothing. Maybe he was going to proposition Teresa Hallbach for a three-way with the old lady when she got out of the clink. Who knows? But calling somebody multiple times, especially in a business setting, is not something to be even remotely concerned with, especially since some of the voicemail messages seem to be erased by the roommate and the ex, which could possibly shed light on this, on what was said on them. Did anyone ever follow up with that? Hmm, coincidentally not. Speaking of which, did Stephen Avery actually leave a voicemail for Teresa Hallbach or Auto Trader? Were any played at the trial? Wouldn't that give a clue to motive or lack thereof? Now the Star 67 thing, okay, that I'll at least somewhat give you, but just somewhat. Because I can't think of a single other reason to use that unless he either wanted his privacy or he wanted to get a hold of her and couldn't because he knew that she didn't like him and since her boss didn't take her off the case, so she's the only one taking the pics to get this van sold, he probably wanted that van in the magazine that month and it was his only option in order for him to get a hold of her. Aside from that, yes, it is curious, but nothing that comes remotely close to anything resulting in means, motive, or opportunity. But if she really didn't like him, this can be explained too. Business is business. You don't like someone, but you still have to tolerate them for business purposes. Ever heard of that thing called politics? Number 11. He used a false name. Come on, again, media hype. He used his sister's name, who the van belonged to. That's not a false name. Another media hype garbage talking point. 
Just today, as of this writing, I called a manufacturer of a product for my spouse since she was on the phone for another reason, and I gave the manufacturer her contact information so they could supply her with the warranty information she needed about the product she currently had. Does that make me a murder suspect? Again, the media is hyping this. Just one more example of his supposed guilt. Number 12, the bone fragments with the steel radial belts in the fire pit. Why is this argument even being made? Because supposedly tires burn well since they're made of petroleum ergo they were used as an accelerant? Sure, just like pot is a performance enhancing drug, you can shave with peanut butter and use saran wrap as a condom. The only thing pot ever enhanced was Taco Bell's bottom line. Yeah, you can shave with peanut butter, but no one does because it doesn't come off and you smell like peanut butter all day. I myself have had conversations with two separate old timers who said that they actually did use saran wrap as contraception because when they were young, you couldn't get condoms except from a pharmacist and in small towns, people talk. So if you wanted to get busy, you'd have to use saran wrap and a strap. Point is, even though they burn hot and well, tires are not an accelerant. If Stephen Avery did do this and used the tires to increase the heat to create the remains, then he's smarter than we give him credit for. Then again, if he's that damn smart, why wouldn't he remember to, oh, I don't know, crush and burn the car, toss the key and get rid of the magic bullet? Seems like something even a dumb person would do. Again, I digress. Also, it's worth noting that many people have said that if the burn pit really was behind Stephen Avery's trailer, then that open air pit would not have been nearly hot enough to cremate a human corpse. Number 13, sweat on the hood latch. This I will discuss in the evidence section because even though it wasn't in the film per se, it is evidence and yet I can explain this away too. The reason it wasn't in the film is because it was taken out of evidence because the stellar batting average of the police in this case continued when the forensic technician who was processing the car forgot to take their gloves off and put a different pair on when they pulled the hood latch and opened the hood, thus contaminating the hood latch and the hood that they touched. This was grounds enough to dismiss this as evidence, but more on that later. And last but not least, number 14, the Avery bullet had Teresa Hallbach's DNA on it. I don't know why this is on the list, 